Bienvenidos a Chocando Mundos. Yo soy Eli Colín. Y yo soy Lupe Colín. Chocando Mundos is a podcast where we talk about Mexican culture and history, dive into genealogy records, and discuss the complexities of cultural identity. Hi, everyone. Today, we are going to talk to Lisette Ayala. Lisette and I worked at uh, a public library together probably about a year ago. Thank you, Lisette, for being here today with us. We're really excited to talk to you. So um, I guess the first thing we should ask you is that why don't you give us an overview about the time you spent in Mexico? For example, when was the last time you visited Mexico? So thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be your first guest. So the amount of time I spent in Mexico really is not a lot. The last time I went was just last year and it was a family vacation. So we got to go to um, Cancun near Escaret. And that was nice, you know, the, the um, getting a chance to be with family in a nice tropical place. Before that, mostly when I was younger, I would do like longer two months, say, with family one month with my dad's side of the family and one month with my mom's side of the family because they lived in two different areas of Mexico. Other than that, that was just really it. It was always summer vacations until we got to like around the age of middle school. And then it was just very rare that we would go back. Mm. So your your parents are from different places. Are they from like a rural area, a city or a town? So... My dad grew up in a um, small town. Eventually, they moved to the capital. He's uh, now they uh, the family lives in Morelia, Michoacan, but they used to be from a small, a little town called Villa Morelos. My dad likes to tell me it was like the Viejo Valladolid, and he, he knows a lot of the history of that area, so he tends to share it. But sometimes it's confusing keeping it all straight. But it was a very small town, and they shared their house with their um, grandparents. On my mom's side, she was actually born near the border in Juarez. Oh, no, sorry, in Durango. And then they moved to Juarez and they lived there for a long time until she was, um, you know, around four or five years old, I think, if I remember correctly. And then she moved to back to where they were originally from, which was uh, Santiago Papasquiaro, Durango. Uh, she's from a, a small ranch there, very, very rural up in the mountains, she she would tell us stories about having to go to the fields with my grandpa to, to um, put the seeds in the ground and everything to to plant everything to help my my grandpa with his um, chores up where they had their fields. Have you ever visited? It's been a long time. Like every time I visited, I visit the family home. I never got to see like outside of there, and honestly, it was it's very desert like and very like. It's very rural. So all you see is a lot of nature. And it's been several years. Like I, I go back to Morelia more than I do to um, Santiago. So I don't get to see a lot of um, my mom's where my mom was from. Mm -hmm. So Lisette, so you say you visited a lot. So when people in the United States ask you, what do you identify as? People ask you, well, what are you? What do you, what do you tell them? So when I meet somebody and they, or I'm talking about myself, I usually identify myself as Hispanic. When I'm in Mexico, I, it's really hard because I don't, I don't blend in. Even though both of my parents are Mexican, both of them were born in Mexico. Um, they can tell by the way that I act, the way that I walk, the clothes that I'm wearing, that I'm not from there. They'll technically under you know, the definition of, of, of Mexican, as far as the influences and things I am, but I, I just stand out all the time. And when I'm here and somebody asks me, you know, where, where I'm from, if it's somebody Hispanic, you usually assume that I was born in Mexico. So when they ask me when I'm from, I always say, okay, well, I was born in Elgin. I was born in the U S and they look at me like I'm lying. Mm, like, yeah. And like, are you pretending to be from the U.S.? I'm like, no, no. And so I always, it's like the speech I had to memorize for myself. I was born here, but my parents are from Mexico, you know? Right. And then they, they would ask a little bit more. I would say, oh, my mom's from Morelia. My dad is from Morelia. My mom's from Durango. Just because it, it's sort of like they they were expecting to hear that I was born in Mexico. And just to hear me, like, 
and for me, it always throws me off because I'm like, where are you from? I'm like, well, I'm from here. Right. No, no, no. But where, where were you born? Where are your parents from? I'm like, oh, they're from Mexico. Yeah. It's a hard question. And I can see how you can not easily blend in in a small town and even more so in a rural area where everyone, of course, everyone's going to know everything about everyone. So somebody is going to stick out as a sort, you know, they're going to stick out if they come and visit. Well, that, that's a funny thing. It's like when I go to Morelia, the, which is the bigger, the capital city of, of Michoacan, they can tell that like, they'll stare at me as I walk down the street because they can tell that I'm not from there. But when I go, when I used to go, like the first couple of times I went to go visit where my mom's from, because it is so small, so small and down, they know everybody, you know, I got a lot of people would look at me and immediately know I was my mom's daughter because I look so much like her. So it wasn't that uh, the whole like acceptance. And honestly, I didn't interact a lot with the, with the people there. Cause I was so small. I usually stayed around family, but when I was like walking down the street to my tia, they would look at me. She's like, oh, she must be Elvia's daughter. She looks yes. just like her. Yes. So it was, it wasn't that whole not belonging. It's just, they immediately identified who I was without me say in both cases, they identify who I am or make assumptions without actually knowing or me saying anything. That's what happens in our town when we go back, for sure. Like, it's it's still a town, but it's, and I wouldn't say it's so small, but it's small enough where you you get recognized and there's, they say, oh, you are mm-hmm. this person's daughter. And it's very obvious that that, mm-hmm. that you are of that family. And even if they don't know, they always ask you, like, who are your parents? Like, who are your grandparents? Where do they live? And just by the location, they know who you are. Like, my grandparents live here. Ah, I know who you are. <laughs> or by your last name, too. Like, what's your last mm-hmm. name? Yeah. Oh, no. And well, the thing is, like, we've gone back to visit where my dad's small town is from. So most of the time when we go to Morelia, or when we used to, at least I used to go, we would spend most of our time in, in Morelia, but then we would spend a couple t- days back in uh, Villa Morelos. And you know, when I would go there, it's like everybody would give me like my whole history. And I'm like, I don't even know you. How do you know more about my second cousins, my grandparents, where they live, what they did? It's like this whole story, uh, family story that I didn't know, but strangers were telling me because they knew my parents once I told them. And in Villa Morelos, there's actually two different Ayala families, but they're pretty big. And they've intermarried at some point in generations, but it's the same thing where they ask, well, which Ayala are you? Like, this Ayala or the other Ayala and they'll start naming people I'm like oh I think it's it's that one oh, that that one <laughs> that's my family but in reality I think they've they've intermarried at least because it's a small town so I, I've, I, I've seen it I've seen people compare families and they always ask was it the poor one or the rich one <laughs> or something is something like so offensive I'm like I don't know I'm not sure yeah but it's like it's it's really weird a weird experience because it comes from strangers like I've never seen these people again in my life yet they're able to say all these things about me that I don't even know yeah I agree with you it's the same with me I it's very difficult for me to memorize names and then I'll say like oh I'm this person's daughter and they'll just shout out like when I speak to people from the town they like oh which Jesus and then they'll like say like from up in the town or de abajo el hijo de De este, o el nieto de este. And I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are. And I just can't follow mm-hmm. the conversation because I don't. And they know exactly who everyone is, even though there's like thousands of people who live there. Yeah. So, Lisette, how well do you speak Spanish? And does that, how does that affect your identity? Do you think it makes, it makes you feel less from Mexico or more from Mexico? My Spanish, I would like to say, is, is okay. <laughs> I I was in bilingual classes since I was little. So my mom managed to keep me in bilingual classes because the whole purpose of the program is to get you to learn English and then move you on to regular classes. But my mom refused to change me until I got to sixth grade. So I was going to go into middle school. And at least in our area, our middle school at the time had a bad reputation. So my mom didn't want me to go there. And that forced her to put me in English classes. But I think if she could have, she would have sent me all throughout my whole education and I you know being the oldest of four we've realized sort of how much that has affected our level of Spanish so for me speaking Spanish is very much my identity because it's part of how I grew up but as I've gotten older 
I feel like I've lost some of it, especially like the writing part. I use it for work every once in a while. But even then, when I speak with other people, especially recent immigrants, my Spanish doesn't match. Or I'll talk to my cousins in, in Mexico City and they use a lot of slang. Even my cousins in Morena, they use a lot of slang. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't understand what they're saying. I have to kind of guess it's like a whole other language. So, I mean, when I think of my Spanish, I think it's more of a, if you want to call it proper Spanish, but just because it was taught without any accents and very academic here in the school district, because they were dealing with kids from all over the place. So um, in other, in some places that will make me stand out because my Spanish is different. But at the same time, you know, as like I mentioned, when I, as I've gotten older, I feel like I've, I switched more to English and it's affecting me now as well, because my daughter and my daughter is in bilingual classes where they call them dual language classes now. And her Spanish is good. It's beautiful, but I can't get her to speak it at home. And one of the things that I've noticed, at least for myself, you know, having translated for my parents and for, you know, for different things for medical school and things like that. I've gotten, it's like almost a muscle reflex where if somebody speaks to me in English and I was speaking Spanish before, I will switch to English. Or if I'm speaking English and somebody speaks to me in Spanish, I will switch, but it's not a conscious change. I don't think about it. I just do it. So when my daughter's home and she prefers to speak English and I want to answer to her in Spanish, I have to make a very, very conscious effort to switch back to Spanish. And then she'll say one word and I'm back to English and I didn't realize that I just switched. Mm, it's just so natural to you. It is. And it's really hard to explain because I'll hear it from, from my parents, you know, like you should speak to, to her in Spanish more. I'm like, I, I'm trying. It's just, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. to explain it to somebody else that that's, that's what's happening. It's become like a, mu a muscle memory thing. Like you just change, you know, and I did learn other languages. I, I did learn French when I was in high school and yeah, there is a difference between learning a language when you're a child and when you're an adult. That that change was not the same. Like I, I have to consciously make the effort to switch to French, even just to practice the little bit that I still remember. It's not the same for Spanish. It's instantaneous. And so it's, I mean, it's part of my identity because at work I use it. I am sort of the, the person who, who speaks for the Hispanic community as far as programming and things like that for work. So it is part of my identity. It's part of my work identity, but the level of my Spanish has changed over the years. I've tried improving it, but it's difficult. It's difficult to, to use it as when I talk to my daughter, to me, it's like a really big part of me. And for her, she got bullied at, at a very young age. One of the, her classmates told her that Spanish was, was awful, that she hated Spanish. And this was somebody who's not a, a Spanish speaker. And she was very, it, it affected her a lot to the point where she didn't want to speak Spanish anymore. So go from somebody like me, who's, you know, my identity, even though I, I don't use it as much in my personal life as me as reading and things like that. Um, I mostly watch TV in Spanish because that helps. And, and I speak to my parents in Spanish and my Spanish is um, pretty good for that. To hear my daughter say something like that, it's it's very hurtful because I it's part of her roots, it's part of her identity, and she's telling me she hates it. Yeah, it's hard. I'm also trying to teach my son Spanish, and it can be hard to switch. I'm very good at still speaking to him and switching with my husband. We should, my husband and I should speak more in Spanish, but sometimes the conversations that we're having are really hard sometimes to do it in Spanish. Sometimes it's very technical. He's explaining to me about his work and it can be hard to do that in Spanish, especially if you don't have the vocabulary. So the site, your parents though, they're from different places. Are there, is their Spanish different? Is it, is it noticeable? It has gotten better over the years. I think there was more of a difference when they first got together. Just different words that you say for different things. Every once in a while, I'll still come up with food. Like my mom will say she's making something. Um, I can't think of the example right now. And my in my dad's head, it's something else. And then he yes. comes home and he sees the food and he's like, I thought you were going to make this. I'm like, my mom's like, well, yeah, this is what it is. And he's like, no. It's oh my gosh. Like this, 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 this. And my mom's like, looks at him like he's dumb. I'm like, okay, well, if you want to cook it, go for it. 
it's lost in translation. <laughs> it's lost in translation. Well, it's, you know, regional food too. It's, yeah, it's... right. But like my mom was always a very studious person. So she, she read a lot. And so she would, I mean, I think this was on her part was a very conscious change. She would try to improve her Spanish and to make it clean. So no, no jargon, no um, slang. Because she knew that if she said any of those words, even within the Hispanic community, they would identify where she was from and they would make fun of her. And mm. so to try to, to dissuade some of that, she purposely cleaned up some of her language. And I mean, some of it, she just never used it anyway, but she was very careful about the way she spoke. So my mom has always been very calm in her response. She'll, she'll listen and then she'll respond. And my dad... It's taken a while. It's taken a while. Because I remember even as a little girl, sometimes he would say something and my mom would be like, don't say that in front of the girls. So yeah. um, I, I, it's changed. And I think a lot of it also has to do with them not living in Mexico anymore. So you're not around it. So they're not picking it up as in Maya. But my mom especially has been really good at learning. Even though she doesn't say, she'll understand it. Like if there's slang or other words that we use for the same items, she will learn it and be able to identify where that person is from. Like um, autobus, guagua, bus, you know, they're all sort right. of, they mean the same object, but my mom can tell, oh, well, this is from this in, you know, in Puerto Rico, they say it like this and Colombia, they may say it like this, but it means, you know, universally it means this. Yeah. So Lizette, um, follow up question, speaking about differences, What's the main difference you see when you visit between the United States and Mexico when you go visit? So lately I've been visiting more of the, honestly, the touristy places. Cause when we were little, we always visited family. We never went to any of the touristy places. So now that we're older, we are more, we, we choose to go more to the touristy places. So some of the things that I've, you know, my, the point of view there is a little bit different just because it, it is geared towards tourists. Um, but honestly, that's that's what I've seen recently. Some of the things that I've noticed is, at least in those places, you still get some, I don't want to say, dis well, maybe it is discrimination. Well, so so this last place, for example, that we went to, um, it was an all-inclusive resort. You know, we, we speak Spanish, not an issue with the language. You know, we, we deal with the money. We didn't have to buy much, so not an issue with the money either that would, like, alert people that were not from there. But dealing with the people at the resort was interesting. And I've never had this experience before where we went as a family. So it was my parents, my sisters, and my daughter. We went to the resort and most of the people were very nice. But we noticed that when we went to get, to get served, if my dad wasn't with us, people would ignore us or give us a stink eye. And then, and then I realized that most of the servers were men. So like machismo is still very... <laughs> very strong in Mexico that hasn't changed but yeah it was interesting to notice that when my sister or I or both of us with my daughter were together anywhere sitting to eat the level of service that we would receive was really weird like I don't know if they knew we were from the U.S. or they assumed that we were from the U.S. because we saw other groups that were getting treated better than us and they were also from the U.S. but they were like you could tell they were from like California and stuff like that they were um I don't know. There, there's something. There's something. There's always something. Yeah, they they would just give us a stink eye, and we're asking for you know just a drink. Machismo, yeah, machismo for sure. I think is still really um, relevant. When you're younger, you I didn't really notice it, but now as I'm growing older, the people that I even grew up with that are from Mexico, it's clear that they some of them are very machista and they are young they're young people mm -hmm. it's not like they're oh they're young. older they're yes so i think it's a very hard um it's very hard to get to get rid of that i mean it, somebody probably has to say in one of the generations like we're gonna stop like we're not gonna be like this anymore i think yeah and it's what i found interesting is that because it's supposed to be an all-inclusive resort and it was promoted as american friendly I thought it would be different, you know, that I had certain expectations, not not like above and beyond, but just like, don't take 20 minutes to bring me a glass of water sort of thing. And in, in reality, we didn't really notice it towards until towards the end of our stay. 
that we noticed it more because until then we had been eating together most of the time. And towards the end, we started doing our own separate things. So my dad wasn't always with us or they would be hungry before we were. And that's also when we noticed the change because we we noticed an instant, like almost all of a sudden we're getting all these drinks and all this attention out of nowhere. And the only difference was my parents were with us. And my sister told my dad at one of them's like, you know, I asked for this and he gave me, uh, I asked him for two iced coffees because one was for me and I was at the buffet with my daughter getting her food. You know, they, he made the server made my sister feel very uncomfortable because she's like, okay, well, you know, I want two coffees. And he took his time, brought them back. And he's like, out of courtesy, I brought you a second one. He didn't realize there was somebody else sitting with my sister. They thought she was by herself. And then she was asking for too much because they're only supposed to serve one drink at a time. But the minute my dad showed up, oh, he kept getting his drinks like he asked for a, a mojito. So he kept getting those. They just kept coming. And they saw when my sister told them what had happened. And they just, and it, to me, it's like, it, it defeats the purpose of being this just good service, but I do understand that where they're coming from and everything. And it made it very uncomfortable. And I remember the last day that we were there, my mom was, was scared because her flight was leaving before ours. She's like, you guys aren't going to get breakfast if I don't sit there with you. So my mom and my dad ended up like, forcing us to because we wanted to sleep in because our flight was till later but she's like oh, come on come on you have to show up at breakfast early because we want to make sure you get food you get served I'm like it, it shouldn't be like that but we didn't see other people being even other Mexicans being treated that way which was made it really really weird it was good that they went with you because I knew you wouldn't have eaten <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and you were thinking you know, of money talks you would think that that would be enough I mean there was like one lady one lady one female server there she was awesome. I wish I, I remember her name so I can give her a shout out, but she was on there when we finished our coffee. She would bring us more coffee. She was helpful with everything. She told us, because we wanted to sit where she was sitting, but they move her around sometimes in their area so we can sit in her area. The level of customer service she gave us was far beyond any of the men. And, and that's when we, you know, part of the reason why we realized, you know, Machismo is still alive in Mexico, unfortunately. For sure. So, Lisette, we're going to take a little bit of a break, mm -hmm. and then when we come back, we're going to talk about your genealogy, your family roots. So, we'll be back in a bit. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We're back, and we're going to talk to Lisette Ayala about her uh, family tree, her genealogy. Uh, after doing some research, Lisette, and you already mentioned this, um, but your dad's side of the family is from Villa Morelos, Michoacán, and it seems like a couple generations back, they lived in Quiroga, Michoacán, and then your mom's side of the family is from Santiago, I wasn't sure how to say this one, I, I thought it was Papasquiaro, but then I watched a YouTube video of somebody saying it, and it was not like that, I think it was Papasquiaro, Durango. So how would, how do you say that? <laughs> so I would say, and I always have a hard time saying it too, Santa, Santiago Papasquiaro is how yes, I say it. That's how I, I, that's how I think he said it, the guy in the video. So I was saying it, I was putting a lot of emphasis <laughs> on the A. You know what? It's because there's a town, a city sort of by us that's called Sitacuaro. So I think that's how I'm, I'm trying to say that a little bit. So that's why I kept, but then you know what? They kept saying it, all these people kept saying in the videos, they just called call it Santiago. They were like, oh, we're in Santiago. And they would just skip the second word, which was, I think. Funny. Yeah. Like where my mom is from. And I don't know if it came up in your research. The specific like ranch she's from is called Martinez de Abajo. And there's okay. a Martinez de Arriba. So mm, how far is that from from the actual? How far is that from? Yeah, from Santiago. How far is it? It's a thing about an hour, but we did it the last time in it's been a while. So the last time that I did that trip, we took a bus. So a taxi to the bus depot and then the bus to the to where my aunts still live. I still have one aunt that lives in that area. Um, so I think it was about an hour. It might have been more, but I was little, so I don't remember. Wait, so you're saying that the town where your mom is like from from is an hour away from the actual town? At least, yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's super far, I think. Holy moly. Yeah. I don't know how my mom did it. She was she had a, she had me and my three younger sisters, and the youngest was under a year old. 
So we were carrying like cans of formula with us at the same time. Yeah. So and all the diapers and stuff because we weren't sure we we're going to find them in Mexico. So yeah, that must have been, I think in high school was the last time I visited Durango. Wow. That to me is super far. I mean, coming, our family is from really the center of town. You can't get you can't get closer. I mean, everything is just down the block. So for me, and then my husband's family is a little bit farther away from from the town. But I mean, you can get in a car and get there in like ten minutes, five ten minutes, you know. But an hour just seems super far for sure. Mm-hmm. Um. So you said that you have visited both of these places, then Villa Morelos, yeah. and even have you visited Quiroga or no? I have. Because it's not that far away and they have a lot of, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, uh, Quiroga is the capital of candy making, I think, in Mexico. Interesting. So we would used to go there for, to baby, to buy like things. Like sometimes we would get little pottery sets, like tea sets, but you know, the Mexican version and they were like little pottery sets and we would get a lot of handmade stuff. They had a lot of handmade stuff and all the candy. Hmm. Guitars from there are well known as well. I did see some of the records that mentioned that, and I was like iffy because I'm like I don't remember my dad saying that he was from there. He liked it there, and we would go visit, and like make it as one of our visits while we were there. But I don't remember my family talking about being from there. I think it's way back from what I remember from the research. I'm pretty sure. Let me see. I can go to your dad's side. It would have to be. Rafael Ayala, which was your great great grandfather, I think. So I think he had kids there, but then they moved to Villa Morelos. So mm-hmm. I mean, that's a long. It would be a long time, I think. Long time ago, yes. Yeah, especially. Yeah, it's like three generations, three three or four generations ago. So, mm-hmm. so, the other thing that I was going to ask you is, how did your parents meet? I mean, your mom is from Durango, which is basically mm-hmm. north. And then yeah. your dad's from Michoacan, which is maybe the center of Mexico. How did they even mm-hmm. meet? So they both immigrated to the U.S. I don't have exact dates, but I'm going off of when they got married, which was 1979. Uh, so before then, <laughs> they were actually neighbors. My aunt, the uh, the oldest female aunt, uh, moved to the U.S. first and in this area where I'm from. And she and her husband um, rented a house. And when my mom came, she came to stay with her. She was trying to work to, to you know, send money back to the family in Mexico. And my dad also had immigrated. I don't know if it's around the same time, but he actually lived next door to her. So the, the person who owned the house and rented it to my aunt also owned the other house where my dad was renting a room with his brothers. So they didn't have like a whole apartment or anything, but they were rent- renting a series of rooms. So they would see each other. And I think I heard from my my sister recently, she told me, and I didn't know this. One of my uncles was in the same English class as my mom. Oh, cool. So he kind of introduced them, but they would see each other because my mom, you know, would sit outside on the steps and um, where they live is close to a park. So my dad would go to the park and play, you know, soccer every once in a while. And, and that's how they started um, getting to know each other and, and met each other and then ended up getting married. Yeah, that's so interesting. A lot of the people that I know, their parents are from the same town. So when I went back, I was like, wait, Lissette's family is not even from like, they're from different places. I'm like, how do they even meet? Sometimes you would <laughs> see when, you, when you're when you researching genealogy, you're, you see some some odd town sometimes, but it's close by, you know, like Quiroga and Villa Morelos. They're pretty close. Mm-hmm. It, they're not far yeah. at all. But Actually, um, I put it on the map and I was like, that's super far. Like they did not, there's no way that they met in Mexico. Like they would have to go to like Mexico City or something, something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. So it it doesn't surprise me that they met in in Elgin then. So do you, would you consider yourself more Michoacan or Durango? Actually, neither. I don't, because I've lived most of my life in the U.S., I consider more, more myself of a, and I don't know if this is a proper word, like Elginite. I, I know more of the history of Elgin than I do of Morelia and Durango. I've I've looked it up. I read it. My dad gave us a tour of the churches every time we go. Uh, but we don't, I, I just, I don't identify because it's not, it's not where I'm from. It's where my, my history is from. 
And it's I, I do have interest in learning more about that. But even then, like when I talked to my mom about her cooking, she told me that she had learned cooking because she left when she was really young. Like when she married my dad, she was 18. My dad was 28. Um, so there's a there's a huge age gap in between as well. But she knew how to cook some things, but she didn't know how to cook everything because you know, you split your your work when you're when you're living with family and, and it wasn't always her her turn to cook. So she knew how to make some things, but not everything. And she told me that a lot of the cooking that she learned was from people giving her recipes, like people she worked with would share recipes with her, and they were from all over the place. Or she would get them from magazines or books. So even the food is not traditional. Like there is some that she makes that's traditional from that area, but a lot of the stuff that she makes and she's trying to teach us is is not like regional to her area. And well, my dad doesn't cook, so <laughs> he will, he only like, gives you advice on how it should be done. But it's the same thing. Like my grandmother came to visit us once. My dad was able to get permission to have her come and visit us. And I remember my grandmother saying, oh, yeah, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't he never watched me cook. So because he would always say, oh, my mom's cooking is better than than this. My mom doesn't cook like this. And that one visit was enough to give my mom vindication. She, he, she was like, no, this is really good. And my mom's like, you, Ramiro told me you made it different. You know, what do you do differently? She's like, Ramiro doesn't know anything. He never seen me cook. <laughs> I think it's just something, <laughs> sometimes the idea of like, oh, that tastes uh -huh. so good or something. I don't know, but I do go and I, I feel like the food is really good. Everywhere I go, I'm like, the tacos are just amazing mm -hmm. compared to the United States. I, at least I haven't found that many good places. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had conversations with my mom, like when we go, because like I said, I, I visit Morelia more often than I visit Durango. Um well, I haven't been recently, but when we do go, you know, we eat at the markets, we, we buy food from the, the, the weekly, uh, tianguis that they put up and stuff like that. And the, we think that one of the reasons why the food tastes different is also because it's less chemicals. Like what we call organic here is just food in Mexico, you know? And it's less time. It's less time that it's like frozen, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like you it's see more, the, it's a pressure. bunch of, pr of produce, they, it comes from Mexico. So it just spends less time. Mm -hmm in the frozen area or, you know, sitting somewhere. So I can see that for sure. And the, even the meat is fresher. We were, we were just talking about that mm -hmm. the other day, how just the meat is fresher. Everything is like killed like the day of or the day before. So it just tastes different. Yeah, that was, that was a new concept for me for, not, for meat not to be cold, but warm was kind of weird for me. Uh, some of my family members have been, or at some point were butchers. So they also make the carnitas. They were really good at them. At least that was one thing the guys did cook. You know, they would make carnitas and we would buy it. But yeah, like the, the taste is different and just the colors are also brighter. Yeah. Because it's so fresh. I think that makes a big difference. Yeah. To say that I identify with, with one or the other, it just did not really. <laughs> so do you like visiting one place more than the other? I mean, for me, it's. I do like being outside in nature so I can see how Durango might feel a little bit different, but mm -hmm. it's so far, you know, you said that it's so far from the town or you wouldn't get mm -hmm. that, that aspect of it, which is kind of disappointing, but your parents now are visiting Morelia a lot more, which is a much bigger city. So that can be exciting as well. Do you prefer visiting one place over the other? I, I do. Just because I think I've been spoiled the longer I've been in the U.S. Like one of the things that I do, and I, I do hope to do this with my daughter one day, is that when I go to Mexico, it humbles me to see how people live. We do have a, a house, well, not me, my parents do, that we stay in, in Morelia. And, and I mean, it's, it's not an Airbnb, but it's, you know, it's very, very simple, minimalist. We have beds, we have tables, we have dishes. But, you know, somebody's not living there, you know, full time. So a lot of the stuff that I would have here at home, like my computer, being able to use the hair dryer and the cur you know, curling iron at the same time without blowing a fuse, you know, <laughs> you know that, that sort of thing. And just the water, when we collect the water, we have to usually, when we, before we go, we have to let somebody know so that we can collect water because only water, the water is distributed once a week. So when we come to visit, if we don't give my uncles or somebody a heads up to turn it on for us. We're not going to have water when we get there. So it's all of those things humble me and remind me how lucky I am to be where I am and to have the luxuries like running water that I do have. 
So in, in that aspect, I, you know, I, it's one of the things I do like, even though it sounds kind of harsh, I, I kind of like it because it reminds me to be grateful. And there is more to do there. I do like visiting. I've had a chance to visit several other universities and just walk around and see. And they have some awesome food. So I like to eat the food there. Also, Morelia is a UNESCO site. So a lot of the structures are still colonial. So it's nice to see the architecture and just learning more about the, and now that I'm older, you know, especially um, more of the craftsmen and the artisans and things like that and getting to see all of that. So there's more to do and see. The last time I visited Durango, and it could be different uh, since then because it's been several years. So Martinez de Abajo, or de Arriba, I forgot which one my mom's from. <laughs> you know, so part of the trip is, you know, you go to Santiago, from Santiago, you go to Martinez de Abajo. My mom still lives outside of that. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So where my mom, it's a ranch. Like there is, there is nothing to do there. When I was little, my biggest thing, and I think I might've been about five, six years old. I wanted to get up to go see how they milk the cows. That was like my thing I wanted to do because I had never seen anybody milk the cows. I was not able to get up early enough to see them milk the cows, oh. but I got to play with chickens. So, you know, that was fun. But it's it, that is like completely rural. There are other places there, like I said, it's a small ranch. So there really isn't much to do. And it's very desert-like. Mountains and greeneries and stuff like that, but it's, it's very desert-like. That's one of the... When I ask sometimes people about where they live in Mexico and if they like it, they say, a lot of people say, no, I don't really like it. It's it's sort of what you're describing. It's like a ranch. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. It, you're in the middle of nowhere. There's no access to anything. And so I think that they, as maybe it, even as you get, as you become like a teenager, you start to mm -hmm. say like, what are, we, what are we doing here? Like, it's so boring or something yeah. like that, you know? You go there to visit family because that's where family happens to be, but that's not really where you want to be. Yes. <laughs> like my aunt does live still there. She lives, she doesn't live in the ranch. She actually lives in Martinez de Abajo. I'm going to get this wrong and get yelled at later, but Martinez de Abajo. So she, it's sort of like a mini town. So that part is a little bit better because there's, there's more activity. Um, She has her own like little store that she runs a popcorn stand from and then she's got candies and snacks and she's right in front of the plaza. You know, people going to the park to 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 hear music or to just take a walk or whatever, sometimes buy stuff from her. It's a bit more happening, a bit more happening. It's a bit more happening, especially in, oh, we're in, I think it's August. They have a huge month long party. So everybody who's from there leaves around that time or July. Sometime in the summer, there's a huge, the, the carnivals come in, people from all over come in for expositions, and they have musicians from all over. Every night there's music. So there's more happening there than I would ever see in the ranch that, where my mom actually lived. Yeah. So now let's set, we're going to get into the fun questions or hard okay. questions, actually, of the... Okay episode um you're gonna have to make some hard hard decisions Eddie, do you want to okay. start us off with the first question yes the first question will be what's your favorite mexican food my favorite mexican food is enchiladas but my mom's enchiladas i get very critical when i go out and i try other people's enchiladas they don't taste like mom's so are they green <laughs> or are they red Lisette? Red chocolate sauce, as I call them, because it has chocolate and dulces. So, yeah, we really like. I really like my mom's enchiladas too. They're green though, so in my in our area where we're from, it's uh, a lot of the dishes are green, um, but where my husband is from, a lot of the dishes are red. So that's why I'm asking. And I guess we do make mole, which is a little bit on the sweet side. I would say we have that, but I don't think any other food we really put a ton of sweet into it what about uh what is your least favorite mexican food that's hard having grown up here and my mom always gave us very bland stuff when we were little so now as i'm older i'm just starting like enchiladas i only started liking when i was in high school i think before then i wouldn't eat them and, and now there's still some food that i don't eat uh, because of the spice i don't like chile as sacrilegious as that is for Mexican. I do not like spicy. I don't like jalapenos. So it makes it hard because I want to learn how to cook all the food that my mom makes. 
but, but all of it is with salsa yeah yeah like I want to learn how to make it because it's you know family traditions it's her recipes and you get used to the smells yeah like, um what are the chiles we make some chiles for for cuaresma I'm trying to remember what they're called they're like dipped in the egg batter uh chiles it's not rellenos? rellenos yes so we make chiles rellenos my, well my mom makes the chiles rellenos and those are, I can tell you, those are ones that I do not like at all. And the reason I don't like them is because as I got older and I was able to help her with the cleaning, I had to clean all that mess. <laughs> I didn't it's a lot them. of work. I it's a lot of work. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of work. prep too. You have to like char them and then peel them. And it's yes. a lot and of work. So, and the flour gets everywhere. Then beating the egg whites. And it's just and the, and the oil, the smell. Got <laughs> so just because of all of that, and like I said, I've never made them. I don't eat them. <laughs> just the cleaning of it, and I don't even clean it all that often. But when I do, when I did clean it, I was just I hated it. I didn't, I didn't like it when my mom made them because then the mess, like Iguaresma came around, and I was freaking out because I knew that that mess was coming back, and the smells are coming like, back. They penetrate. The it penetrates your clothes, your hair, everything. Yes, yes, it penetrates everything. So if I had to go to work in the afternoon. And I was leaving and I, because I was at home all day long, I was so scared. I was going to go smelling like burnt oil to yeah. work <laughs> and everybody could smell me. Um, Ellie and I were talking about other, other um, food that is controversial. Like, do you mm -hmm. like lengua or no? Oh, yeah. I do. I can eat lengua. I but love once lengua. I figured out what was in menudo, I couldn't eat menudo anymore. The consistency of menudo, menudo is kind of, isn't it stomach? I, I forget. I think it's yes, the lining of a stomach. I actually saw like the, the honeycomb shapes in it and stuff. And I was like, yes. yeah, no, 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 thank you. I do like pozole. That one took me a while because of the, the pozole. Like it, sometimes it has to do with textures. So like the, the pozole, a grain, um, I, I liked everything except for that. And it took me a while to get used to it. And now I'm fine. And I'm pretty sure that'd be the same with the other Mexican foods. It's just getting me to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about like, uh, we talked about hígado. Have you had that before? No, I can't do hígado. It is so good. I really like it. I haven't had it in a long hígado. time, but. Um, I doused it in ketchup and still couldn't eat it. There's not It's a really healthy, Lisette. I recommend I it. I know. <laughs> I know it's healthy. I can't eat it. What do you, what. What food do you prefer, I guess, to eat? Like American food or Mexican food, if you had to choose? I want to say if, well, it really is an, in a, you know, my, the stress my sister's crazy, but it's like on a case per case basis. If you put enchiladas against anything, I'm probably going to go enchiladas. But I have developed a sort of, I want to say international, but it's very American international. So, you know, I, I worked in, in Seattle for a while and I was, um, the branch, the library branch I was working at was in Chinatown. So I developed a taste for authentic, as authentic as it could get, Chinese food. And I can't find that anywhere here in Illinois unless I go to Chinatown. Oh, in Chicago? Yeah. Yeah. So other than that, I can I cannot find that food anywhere and I really miss it. But in, you know, all the other foods as well, you know, if, if we eat a little bit of everything, even though we, like when my mom first started living here she she was mostly mexican food all the way but as we've gotten older and we're trying to be healthier you know it's really hard sometimes to make those mexican recipes healthy so she started adding other things it just doesn't taste the same it's it's hard but i think you can make a few changes like my mom likes to put them in oil a little bit the the enchiladas before she puts them in the sauce and i i don't quite taste the difference like if she does it or doesn't do it so when I make them, I, I don't do it because I can't taste the difference anyway. So I don't care. But she can taste the difference, you know? Yeah, because when you get used to a certain taste, I think. Or consistency. Like, it might be a consistency thing, too, where, like, if you fry them a little bit, they just might be a little tougher to eat and not so soggy. So I can see how that might be, like, different for sure. Yeah, we've been experimenting where sometimes we bake the enchiladas. They don't taste the same. No, but we're like oh, it's healthier, and we eat. It anyway. Your mom's a baker, though, right? I feel like I kind of remember you saying that. Yeah, that your mom likes to try different recipes, like baking recipes, right? Yeah, she does. So she's actually learned, and this is this is very interesting. So, you know, her she lost her mom when she was very young. So a lot of like the stuff that you would learn from your mom, 
my mom didn't get it. She either got it, maybe she learned some from her sisters, but mostly she learned on her own. And now with the advances of technology and YouTube and all those people who record themselves, like making bread and things like that, she spends a lot of time, like that's sort of her hobby to bake. But she, in the last couple of years, especially since a couple of years before the pandemic, she started learning how to make Mexican bread. So pan dulce, so conchas, and cortadillo. Oh, and my God. Anytime she makes any of these, they just fly. You need I mean, to they invite do not me to your house when she makes them. <laughs> and and she's, she experiments because she keeps, like, she'll make a cortadillo and she likes the recipe, but she's like, oh, maybe I'll cut back on the sugar because she's also watching her health, watching her sugar. You know, she'll cut back on the sugar and she's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have cut that much back. And then she'll look at other recipes and compare them. And I keep telling her, you really need to make notes of all of these because then you're going to forget and you'll do it again. And you don't remember which recipe you used or how much sugar you cut off the recipe. Because again, these aren't professionals doing the videos. So sometimes it's just like by hand measurements, like un puño de esto, una pizca de esto. And so my mom learned early on that she needed to measure everything in cups and spoons in in baking especially it's not like cooking it's very i want to say scientific like a a bit more baking soda can really make a difference or adding water or Mm -hmm. less flour or it's not like cooking where you can just you can really throw it together sometimes like if, if you know what you're doing you can be you don't actually need a recipe but with baking it's so different it's so precise so yeah i do agree that she has to keep notes on uh, if she likes a recipe, especially. Yeah. And the cortadillo is like her, her favorite one. Like my, my niece just had a, be- a birthday recently and that's what she asked for her birthday cake. She's like, grandma, can you make me cortadillo? And then, you know, that pink bread, with, the bread with the pink stuff on top. And my mom's like, okay. Nice. They, um, she's an awesome baker. She, she just made um, gorditas de nata. So that's what I had for breakfast. This morning. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> So are you still uh, celebrating any uh, Mexican traditions? Does your family celebrate Dia de Muertos? I know in some regions they don't. Reyes, Pascua, all of those. So I think the only one that we we used to celebrate more was maybe Pascua, more the religious side of it. Not really like the he- the Easter egg hunts and things like that. That's more American, you know, how you would usually do a big party. They would do a big meal on Easter, but that's about it. Other than that, we really didn't. Like a lot of like Day of the Dead, we wanted to learn more about it. But honestly, my sister was the one who kind of got it. One of my sisters as a project for school had to do something about that. She's the kind of the, like the one who educated everybody else. My parents don't celebrate it. They don't do it, which is ironic for, especially for my dad, because that's one of the places that I think was the, if not the birthplace, was the place that was known to celebrate Day of the Dead. Yeah. In some regions, it's not, people don't celebrate it as much. So yeah, I'm surprised that your dad even, they do it a lot in school. And sometimes, and Ellie and I were talking about it, how our family doesn't really celebrate Day of the Dead, but in the region, the schools, they do celebrate it. So every year you would do an ofrenda, every classroom would make one and it would be like competition and it would be a whole thing. But then like as a family, we wouldn't really do that. I mean, we would have altars for like the virgin, but, but not for family, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, for, I think the only one that we really like still try to keep a tradition going is cantándole las mañanitas a la virgen. Oh, December 12th. Yeah, December 12th, singing for the singing to the Virgin. And we usually watch the, the live telecast from Mexico for that. But like the posadas, we never ever did them when this church was doing it. We didn't do them ourselves. Um, I had a chance once to go see it in Mexico. Like my aunts were in Morelia, actually. Uh, when my aunts were part of the procession, so they would also host the posadas. So I got to see them, what, what it was supposed to look like in Mexico one time. But yeah, other than that, no, a lot of the traditions that are traditionally Mexican, we've picked up on our own by like learning and and looking up the information because my parents just don't, they don't celebrate that stuff. And it's not that they don't believe, for example, for the Day of the Dead, my mom didn't want us to do the altar because she said that it would call back the spirits and they should be where they're supposed to be. They're not supposed to be coming back to visit the living. They're supposed to move on. So that's one of the reasons why she didn't want to do an altar. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're all to a, to a point we, we believe. So uh, when weird stuff started happening, the one time we did it, we're like, yeah, I don't know if we're going to continue this tradition because I, I think it worked. I think it worked too well. It worked too well. <laughs> 
Well, oh my gosh, Lisette, thank you so much for um, uh, being with us today. We really enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully we can have you back one day and we can talk about uh, your interest in genealogy. I think um, our listeners would really appreciate that. You can follow Lisette on Instagram if you want. Her, um, she also is interested in bullet journaling, and so you can follow her on that. Her Instagram uh, handle is Mommy Reads Plans, or you can follow her on LinkedIn as well, uh, Lisette Ayala. We used to work in the Chicagoland area, so if anyone's interested, you can you can go ahead and add her. But thank you, Lisette, for being with us today. Do you want to add something else or? Yeah, just thank you for having me. Good luck with all your your podcasts. Wish you well. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being our first guest. I know it can be a little hard sometimes, but we really, we really appreciate it for sure. Yeah, you set a good, a good standard. Yes, everyone now has to (laughs) beat Lisette at this point. She had a lot of interesting stories. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. And have a good day.